Hello everyone, welcome. Oh. Hello everyone, welcome back. Sorry for my uh, absence lately. I've just been uh, working on some schoolwork lately. I just finished college around. Uh... Yeah, so I just finished college around April, late April. So I had to take some time off to focus on college, but as of right now, I am gonna play some speculator today and today our main objective is gonna be to create an income portfolio basically off of a bunch of asset allocation and everything but quickly I have a quick slideshow before we cover into the details about the game so right now I'm just gonna say that like none of this is should be taken as financial advice this is only for entertainment purposes but it is very very interesting the strategies that you can learn with this game that you can apply once you do your research and you understand what you're doing. And it does take a good amount of time to get very good at investing and, and everything else. So, um, and investing also has to do a lot with the scenario. So I don't understand the current side. I don't understand the, like the viewers current scenario, what they're going through and what's the best optimal strategy. So hence why I would suggest if you have any financial struggles or difficulties, I suggest you go and see a CFP before you uh, consult your own self. Anyways, so today we are going to be playing uh, like basically we're going to be playing Speculator on difficulty two with tax. And I'm tempted on doing 20 years instead of 30 years just to make the stream a lot more shorter because I think it takes at least 10 hours sometimes for me to go through a 30-year gameplay so that's why I tend to stream a lot but today we're going to be covering a bit of a fixed income dash equity dash crypto portfolio because a while ago a few months back before I did go on my four month leave of absence from YouTube to work on schoolwork and everything I did learn a lot during that period but I basically found it very, very interesting where like the creator of the game, Michael, I believe his name is, he created, he created basically the speculator and he decided to add crypto to it, which was nice. So today what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be going through a quick slideshow and then we're going to play through the strategy of the game. So I'm pretty sure what you do is you do this from beginning. And so right here, we got the Income Portfolio Series, Episode 1, Strategy and Approach. So the recommended tools I recommend are a BA2 Plus Calculator. So this is something that I had to get year one when I was in college. It's basically a financial-based calculator. And it's very interesting. You could do a lot of things with it. But what I'm very interested in is basically, if you look over here, like the uh, FE, like the white buttons over here, so basically we do that in order to calculate like the present value of a bond when it comes to that. So I went through a I went through a game and I just took some screenshots a little bit ahead about like how do I value the bond and everything and like potentially how sensitive it is to interest rate increases. So I found that very, very interesting. But today we're gonna to be doing a disclaimer. I am not a financial advisor, just a regular guy in the internet who likes making content. I have, uh, if you have any concerns, please see a financial advisor. And the simulator we are playing today is called Speculator. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, I want to do that. There we go. So the Speculator today is called uh, Speculator by Roin Software, I believe that's how you pronounce it. And it's by Michael D. Jenkins, I believe. Yeah, that's his name. And then he's the creator of the game that we're going to be playing today. It's a very, very good financial-based simulator that I like to play a lot. Doing the right. So the agenda for today's video is going to be going through the basics of some asset allocation and the strategy behind the asset allocation, uh, value and in fixed income, value and in equity, and hybrid and alternative assets. So right now, a very very important thing that I usually tend to say a lot whenever it comes to my episodes and videos is liquidity. That's basically the ability to turn investments from uh, from like what they're invested in to cash without substantial loss in value. And then fixed income is just providing interest payments with a maturity bait, bond price and move with interest rates. 
So then we got the asset allocation. Today what we're going to be doing is doing a little bit of cash maybe. It's low risk, low reward, so it's safety of principle. We got fixed income, which are bonds or debt obligations are sold at par value of 100, mature at 100. They have a set coupon rate and are sensitive to interest rates. So this is for income and safety of our portfolio. And then the equities are the ownership of the company's success or failure of the company. So this is for income and capital gains because equities, if we buy a great company and they become worth more over the next few years, then basically we're going to be able to sell that for a capital gain and make more income. And then alternatives will be cryptocurrencies, speculative bonds, that being junk dash high income bonds. So anything below triple B, generally considered BB and below, is considered speculative. And we're also going to maybe do a little bit of commodities, but we're maybe going to be doing cryptocurrency and maybe some junk bonds in this series. And so like this is for mainly capital gains dash speculation. So we're not, we're not investing the alternatives just to make income. We're investing it for a bit of speculative gain to make a little bit of profits whenever the uh, cycle works. So one thing that we just, I, I took a screenshot of Investopia and the risk and reward. Basically, this is a very, very important thing to consider whenever you're making your investments is how risky you want your investments to be and how long your time horizon is. So with us being 20 year time horizon, we're mainly going to stick to fixed income and equities and maybe do a little bit of alternatives dash speculative. But basically right now, if you want a low risk, low return, you go and invest in government treasuries and then small caps are generally riskier. But today we're going to be doing cash and cash equivalents, zero. I generally like five to 10% in cash at most. And as of right now, with my own personal portfolio, I'm at about five six percent cash right now so i'm using that towards buying the opportunity buying the dip opportunity because as of right now in real life we're experiencing a lot of volatility and like a good example of that will be the vix so like right now there's something called the vix which is i i like basically it's the global uh like the chicago board of exchange volatility index so we look at it year to date, you can see that there's been a lot of volatility over the last year. And if you look at it like the average over time, it's usually around 10 or 20. But like whenever, in my opinion, it hits 30, I usually consider buying because right now, well, like Warren Buffett has always said, be fearful when others are greedy and green when others are fearful. So right now, a lot of people are fearful about the Russia-Ukraine war that's going on. That's affecting financial markets a lot because companies like Netflix are pulling out of Russia and they're losing out on potential income. So I found that pretty interesting. But the VIX is a very cool thing to track. And another cool video that I found, uh, go put this in our tab. Its name is, Yeah, so like there's this one guy named Chris who, oh, I, I, I just remembered his name. Chris. Can't find it at the moment. A cool video that I like is basically how volatility matters. So like there's this short little video that you can watch by a guy I like to watch on Udemy a lot. I have a lot of Udemy courses of Chris Haroon, I believe that's his name. It basically he talks about how important the VIX indicator is. And he says whenever the VIX basically is high, there's a lot of fear in the system. And whenever it's low, there's not a lot of fear in the system. So that's a real life indicator that I like to look at every now and again. But I don't like to trade off of it. I like to invest off of it. Whenever there's a lot of fear, I tend to buy. Whenever there's not much fear, I'd consider selling. Oh, that was not what I wanted. Uh, I'm doing... Sorry, I'm out of the flow of making content. That's my bad. From current side. So then basically we have low cash, very, very little cash. But the good thing is our income portfolio is going to be creating cash flow every month. So we're going to be able to keep quite a bit of cash. And then we also have fixed income at 40%. So that's my ideal target. And I'll arrange it from 30 to 40 maybe. And equity will be 40 
And so it either be 60 or 40%. But I'm probably just going to do 40% fixed income, 40% equity, and 20% crypto-alternative assets. And an interesting thing I learned about a while ago, and I had trouble finding a source for it, but I found one. Basically, the majority of our portfolio's return will actually come from the asset allocation. Because if, uh, like, during 2020, I made a mistake of... Before 2020, I made the mistake of not buying any bonds because interest rates ended up going down. So if I adjusted more of my portfolio towards fixed income, I would have outperformed. But because I had full equities during 2020, I wasn't doing too well. So having a great, having a great, having like an asset allocation portfolio would basically mean that that's where the majority of your returns come from. So today's strategy we're going to be uh, using a bit of all of these strategies. So it's strategic asset allocation is basically where you set the asset allocation and rebalance period periodically. So like, for example, this is an example of strategic asset allocation. We're sticking to 40% fixed income, 40% equity and 20% crypto. For example, if our, if our, we buy a fixed income and it goes up a lot, We'll have to trim it and then reinvest the profits back into making sure we are back at our base. I don't know why I keep doing that. Uh, just for example, you would buy a bunch of shares, and if they go up in price, you trim and then you reallocate. So basically, you can do it annually, you can do it quarterly, you can do it whenever you feel like it. For strategic, for dynamic, we're just going to be shifting the asset needs to basically the best market conditions. So as of right now, I've heard, a, I've been talking to a lot of people on Joseph Carlson's Discord, and they're saying it might be a good time in real life right now to buy bonds because interest rates are going up aggressively because the Fed is trying to combat inflation. So if interest rates going up, it means that basically after a year from now, there might actually be another recession or we might need cheap money. And so I'll make your bonds worth more. So dynamic wouldn't be a bad idea where like you look for something that is soon the market conditions. So right now, market conditions aren't too well for basically fixed income because fixed income is getting destroyed because of raising rates. Equities are also going down in price. But right now I'm thinking equities or fixed income in real life would be a decent deal right now so and then uh, tactical asset allocation is where you keep a little bit of cash for basically buying until the market crashes so tactical is basically active management and you'll keep a bit of cash just to buy dips and an integrated is basically all three of these combined so we're going to be doing a bit of integrated but the main ones i tend to stick to in wall street raider and speculator are mainly dynamic and strategic. I usually just tend to stick to a certain percentage of investments and then I'll occasionally go above or like for example this is why I have different changes in the portfolio range. So like for example if I think equity is a great deal I'll buy up a lot of equity at 60% of my portfolio and if I think bonds are a great deal I'll do 40. That's an example. So basically, I found that pretty interesting. So this is when I would get out the BA2 plus and basically, oh, and by the way, that thing up there, it says uh, longer duration bonds are more volatile than shorter term bonds. So I'll go into that in a bit more detail. I choose a different, I, like this is a, uh, this is a 20 year bond and I did a short term bond after this to I did a short-term and a long-term bond to show like how sensitive the interest rates are, or at least I would think they are how sensitive they are. So for example, the bond right here, we got credit rating A, current coupon $8.60 or 8.6% and 7.44% yield, yield to maturity 711 and then maturity date 2043. And an interesting thing about bonds that I tend to never really bring up too often is the call provision. So what I found is interesting is the call provision is for 2034. So basically the call provision is the right for the company to call back the bond. So maybe interest rates go down more and they're able to refinance their debts at a cheaper rate. They'll call back the bond, pay an extra 5% because it's at 105. 
So right now the bond price is at 115. So basically in order to get the present value of the bond, we do N. So like I said, with the N, the N button is right there. And then you get I, Y, P, Y, et cetera. And then we basically have the N at times two because bonds tend to pay semi-annually, that being twice a year. So there's 40 payments for this bond. It has an I over Y of 7.47. So that's currently the, uh, the current yield of the bond. And then we got the semi-annual payments and then that. So we're gonna get second PY you do second and then IY on the calculator. So there's like a second button, which is orange. And then you just do IY and then you can get PY and CY. And you got payment of $4.30. So like right now at par, $8.60 per bond divided by two is 430. And then the future value of this bond is gonna mature at $100. So right now we're being above par, which is above 100 for this bond. Sorry about that. So right now, the current present value of the bond, Compute PV, is basically 111, and then we're paying 115 for this bond. So it's a little bit overpriced, but if you can look at the short-term bond, I actually came up with it as very, very overpriced. So for example, uh, in order to calculate the change IY to 10, so I changed the yield of the bond to 10%, in order to make a 10% yield on this bond, the price would have to drop to 87.98. So basically to show how volatile it is, you pay 115 for this bond. And if interest rates go up 2.53%, your bond will drop approximately 23% in value. Because it's a very, very long duration bond. It's for 20 years until it matures. And I have this little image over here where interest rates go up, your bond price uh, drops, but the yield goes up. Interest rates go down, the bond price goes up, and it lowers the yield. So right here, we have a little example of some government. So right before here, this is uh, for Signature Bank. So this is a company. This is a corporate bond. So corporate bonds tend to pay a higher pre uh, tend to pay a higher coupon than government, just because they're more risky. So right here, we got the long versus the short government dates, government bonds. And the benefit about them is there's no call date. So basically your income is guaranteed until that amount is over. But yet the government can still go bankrupt. So if you're looking for a bit more safety, I would probably buy government bonds in this game. But if you want a bit more risk, I would buy the corporate. And almost all the time in this game, I buy corporates. But every now and again, I'll buy government just because I want that somewhat guarantee. Because if this company goes bankrupt, you lose your income. So right here is an example of the long bond and the short bond. So as you can see with my current present value of the short bond, it's at 107 versus 125. So the short bond is at $125 currently in this game. So you're basically overpaying for the bond a little bit. While the long bond is a bit more fairly priced. I just found this very, very interesting too. So then we basically can value equity investments. Another cool thing you can do on this calculator is you do a second CF. And then I just did a negative a negative 15.19 for one of these companies, which is, uh, I forgot what the company's called. Oh, it's from uh, Lucent Technologies, LU. So like this is a fake company that we also got too. So it's 15.19, you're paying 15.19. And I basically just looked at the past EPS of the stock and I discounted it by the borrowing rate. So the borrowing rate for this company is about 5%. So that's, that's another way you can value a company. Another thing that you can do that I find is interesting is you can do something called the NAV analysis. So for example, for example, a uh, NAV analysis will be looking at like the assets and the liabilities and making haircuts to certain pieces of the statement. So like, for example, if you believe the business assets are risky of the company, or you think they may have overpaid for those assets. Well, like, let's just say, let's just say we give it like a 30% discount. So we get 32,739.14 times 0 0.70. So we take a 30% haircut. 
So we got 43,000. So we got 43,000 plus uh, 366.88. Oh, that was not right. So we get that. And then we add it by 3366.88 plus the working capital. So if we want to be conservative too, we could also take a haircut to the working capital, but we took a haircut, a, a decent haircut, like a 30% haircut on the business assets dash equipment, because that stuff depreciates over time. We could theoretically, if that was land, we could potentially um, increase that land by like 2% a year in order to determine the fair value of the business. But we're basically just taking haircuts out of the assets to determine a fair price. So like, for example, if, if uh, amortization for Goodwill was on there, mm. I might take a 30% haircut on that too, because Goodwill is often a overpaying for business assets for now. I'm not too good with that stuff though, but like Goodwill is very, very interesting. And then we just add the six, 906.60. So like we got 53,000 instead of 72,000 for the business. And then we divide it by the shares outstanding and there are 10 million shares outstanding. Oh, okay. That's most likely wrong. I probably just got the evaluation wrong. So if we got 53 million, divide by 10 million. Okay, so we get $5.30 for the book value instead of $7.27 for the book value. So that is right. So if you want to be a bit more conservative with your investment approach, you can actually take care cuts on assets. And here's some pros and cons about the business too. Like uh, the pros for this company is they have no debt, triple A credit rating, $10 billion in liquidity. So having a lot of money in working capital and for cash and cash equivalents, working capital being accounts receivable in inventory. So these are assets that the company can turn to cash in about less than one year. So if that the liquidity is about 10 billion, and it has a sustainable dividend because you can get something called the payout ratio. So the current payout ratio, uh, the current dividend payment, I didn't get it on this thing, but it was one cent and they earned 46 cents last year. So the current dividend uh, yield, the current dividend payout is 2.17%. So in order for the company to get rid of their dividend, it would, their profits would have to drop about 98%. So basically meaning that the dividend is very, very safe generally above 50 is usually when i start 50 or 70 is usually when it starts getting a little bit dangerous and the one problem about the business decline eps so the eps has been declining over the last few years uh quite a high pe so the current price to earnings of the company i don't think i got that yeah it's not in here it was like above 20 i believe and then they have no free cash flow so free cash flow being like the operating minus the invested cash flow. So if you look into a company's cash flow statement, they have something called the operating, investing, and financing cash flows. So the operating is basically the business operations, like what they sell and everything. And then you subtract out the investing. And then basically you get the free cash flow. So after the company is done buying assets to make the company grow, then basically, are they able to generate free cash flow or not? And generally, companies that are bigger, they tend to generate free cash flow. While with smaller companies, they require lots of capital in order to grow. So I'll buy some of this company and make sure their EPS grows. And then we also got another one. Uh, we got a retail supermarket, AMS, the company. And basically what I did is I did a borrow rate of 5.5, did the at net present value analysis, which I forgot to state how it worked. Basically we do second NPV, 5% I, so that's the discount rate, and we get the NPV. So then you do calculate and compute NPV, and then we get the dollar amount. And then so like basically the net present value of AMS stores is $32. 
And the bottom-up analysis, so basically bottom-up analysis is like looking looking uh, top-down, which is the opposite, is basically looking at the macroeconomics, like how well the economy is doing. Like, for example, when the economy does well, cyclical stocks tend to do well. And whenever the economy goes into a bit of slowdown, defensive stocks do well. So as of right now, a real-life example of that is utilities are doing really well right now, and so are oil stocks. So oil stocks are a cyclical company because the price of oil tends to follow the economy. And so right now, cyclical stocks like oil stocks and mine stocks are doing very, very well because inflation is very, very high. There's a lot of demand for gasoline and there's not much supply for it. So, but like here's a top down of analysis of the industry. So as you can see, Trader Joe's is a thousand and 012 price to net worth so basically you're paying 10 times the company's current net worth so basically the book value being uh book value being where's the book value so like right here we can get a calculation of the book value which is seventy-two thousand divided by 10 million shares outstanding is seven dollars and 27 cents for the book value so like that's the price to net worth so for American stores, you're paying about 12% above their book value. So that's a fair that's a fair price that you're paying for the business. Well, as if you're paying 10 times above the book value, that's kind of ridiculously high. And they also got a high they also got a very very poor credit rating and a high PE and a very high ROE. The ROE is good, but I would not buy Trader Joe's in this example using the top down, I know the bottom up analysis because they have a high PE. And it, as you can see, the entire industry is quite develop, um, is quite high with the price to net worth. Another good one would also probably be Kroger International or Fred Mayer. But like once you get above three, I think it's considered very, very risky. But above 300. So then basically we get... And then another interesting thing is like a bond, subsidiary, corporations. So... If we want to, we can look at the NAV per share and just take a haircut on the stocks and subsidiary co co corps. And then we can get a different book value to determine how much the company is potentially worth. So if we want to play a bit safe, we could take a haircut on the subsidiary corps, take a haircut on the bond or whatever, but we're not going to do that. And then uh, here's another example of uh, hybrid securities. Uh, display capture, disclaimer. So right here, we got an example of some hybrid bonds. So these are convertible bonds. So the interesting thing about convertible bonds are they act, they, they act like a bond. So they're a piece of debt. But an interesting thing about it, they're convertible to common stock. So the only problem is that I tend to find is that they're issued by 10 um, not as credit worthy companies because they're, they have to add a sweetener. The sweetener being the convertible feature. So as you can see right here, we decided to pick CNA Financial. And the current year, 2023, borrow rate 5.5, .5, conversion at 71.56 a share. And you get 13, you get about 14 shares per thousand dollars invested. Uh, it's callable now at 102, matures at 2026, the MPV. And there's potentially 59% upside needed to make capital gains off the convertible bond. So the problem with this bond that I decided to pick out of the blue. Uh, where's where's CNA? CNA is over here. So you can see a CNA, 3.6%, 2026, 4.64%, A, $97. So it's almost at par. If the bond trades at par or a bit above par, it means that like basically you can get capital gain but like yeah so like there has to be a bit of run up room in order for the stock to basically be able to grow yeah and then so like right now the current reigns a and yeah so like basically the pros you have to have uh they have a lot of cash to cover their policy reserves so I looked at the company's balance sheet and they're able to cover about 58% of the policy reserves, which is pretty good. They got low debt, good ROE, 
and they have the yield on the convertible bond is higher than the dividend yield. So another thing that I like to do about convertible bonds are is compared to the common stock. So if you look at a company that often doesn't pay a dividend, maybe they have convertible bonds that pay a coupon. So you'll be able to get exposure to the common stock and get a coupon. While as if you buy the common shares, you're not going to get a dividend or you'll get a lower dividend. So it's also good to compare what the corporate, the convertible, it's good to compare the convertible bond and it's also good to compare the common stock. And if a, the company doesn't pay a dividend, that means they're not growing like they're not, like they're growing. Basically, they don't pay a dividend. But if you're looking for income, you can buy convertible bonds to get income. So the normal PE, negative free cash flow at 125 million, underwriting losses were called away at 102. Large upside needed to convert for profit. So you need about a lot. And then we got some junk bonds, which I don't know how, I don't know too well on how to analyze, but I tend to aim for a lower duration whenever it comes to junk bonds, just because like there's a liquidity risk whenever you invest in junk bonds because they don't have the money to really cover their things. And they really have to start, they have to do a lot better. Like they have to make earnings, they have to make revenue and there's not much room for error. So that's why I tend to not really invest in much junk bonds. They were quite attractive though about a year or two ago when interest rates were very, very low if you're looking for income. Another alternative asset or hybrid security you can invest in is uh, called a preferred share. But sadly, the uh, preferred shares are not in this game. But you can invest in preferred shares if you want a little bit of a higher yield than common shares. But preferred shares are very, very interesting too because like, they got a bunch of other things. I do other videos about them. So we've got junk bonds, speculative, current year 2023. It's four years left, eight payments, 8% 8 interest. So if you look at like the compare, this one has a B credit rating. And if we do a comparison on the other bond that we were looking at, for example, CNA, this one's A grade and it yields 7.47 or 7.44%. So in my opinion, I would rather buy an A-grade bond than buy this bond because it is an 8% coupon. If it maybe had a 10% coupon, I would consider buying it. And, ten, and, and, and often, whenever the coupon is very, very high, it means it's not as sensitive to interest rates. So if you buy a coupon of $2, for example, and a, there's a coupon of $8, the higher coupon bond without change in credit risk or anything, will generally be more attractive to rising rates. So this bond will be a little bit less sensitive, but also, no, it wouldn't be more sensitive. It's a junk bond. So this one will be a very, very volatile. So I tend to not really touch junk bonds dash high yield bonds. And yep, uh, shorter duration to help avoid default. Liquidity is important. And right here, we got an example of triple A is considered the lowest risk. Double A is considered low risk. Low risk for A, medium risk for triple B. And then once you go down below BB, these are considered junk where they're high risk bonds. And you're not going to be, I, would, I generally tend to avoid them because there's a high chance of default. So then we got cryptocurrencies of speculative Basically designed for capital gains. Uh, might consider doing covered calls for a bit of extra premium. And we're going to be buying Bitcoin and Ethereum Trust for long-term holds. And then basically a quick summary. Uh, for fixed income, it's for safety and interest. Interest is a debt obligation and comes before profits. It can also cannot be cut without going into default. So like it depends on like the type of bonds you buy because there are different types of bonds you can buy in real life. There's uh, mortgage bonds, senior bonds, and a good one to know about. Most bonds are known as debentures. So if I can just get a quick. So a debenture is a loan certificate issued by a company backed by the credit rather than the specific assets. So if you're buying like a mortgage bond it's backed by something. But if you're buying a debenture, it's not backed by anything besides their credit. 
So if the company goes bankrupt, their credit goes down to the pooper. So like right now we have, uh, so right now we got equities, um, equities for capital gains and dividends. So dividends can be cut by the board of directors and come out of companies' profits. So the board of directors are basically the people that the shareholder that the CEO elects, and they're like the public viewing of everything. They basically control the company, see what the shareholders want, and try to act in the best interest of the shareholders. So if the company sees declined revenue over a long period of time or declined earnings, it's very, very likely they, they will cut the dividend. While as the company becomes more and more profitable, they'll grow the dividend. And an interesting thing about fixed income, I think the reason why they call it fixed income is because you're buying a bond at a set, at a set uh, coupon and it's fixed. It doesn't go up, it doesn't go down. While as dividends, they can go up or down. So if a company becomes more profitable, they'll increase dividends. If a company becomes less profitable, they'll decrease dividends. And then convertible bonds are considered equity as the value of the bond moves with the stock price. So that's known as a hybrid. And speculation has risk of losing. Uh, like basically for crypto, we're going to be speculating a little bit. And generally I consider having 10% maximum for speculation, but in this series we're going to be doing 20. And then junk bonds, etc. You know, that's it. So now we're going to go ahead and play through the game. So right now we're going to start off with 100k USD. And we're going to do it for 20 years instead of 30. And we're doing difficulty 2. Because difficulty 1 has no taxes. So let's go ahead and get our displays up. So we have to wait until the 15th of January before we start investing. So what I'd like to do is I like to have the streaming quotes and the commodities up. So right now we got this. Uh, just making sure it looks good. It's probably good. I also try to make sure I zoom it in that way you guys can see. Okay, this looks good. And then I'll have like a nice little notepad out for uh, bond stuff. So we're, we're going to know when our bonds mature and etc. I don't know. This is not really, you don't really need a notepad, but I just like to write down notes. So right now we're going to go ahead and get started. I usually tend to play on speed 99, but I'm probably going to do uh, 90 because it's a little bit slower. That way you guys can comprehend what's going on with the game and I can comprehend too and explain out my analysis and explain my rationale. So we're gonna go and get started. It's January 10th, 11th, 12th, 15th. Here we go. Now we are we have passed the background check and nothing serious. So basically before you get a DIY stock brokerage account, you gotta make sure you're not like an insider of a company. They'll ask you that question. And they'll make sure you didn't do anything really illegal, which is interesting. So right now we start off the series. So right now this is our asset allocation. So we're going to have 40% uh, fixed income, 40% equities. And then we're going to have 20% uh, speculative. So like we're just gonna do speculative as crypto. So right now we're gonna go ahead and get started with the series. And I'm gonna set a timer for maybe half an hour or an, maybe an hour. I'm not too sure. Probably, I was probably gonna get some work done. I have to get a resume done. So I'm probably gonna set for half an hour of game time. So right now we're gonna go and get started. So what we will do is right now we have 100K in cash and cash equivalents. So we got an inheritance. Now we got to go ahead and research our companies. So what I do is I just, uh, like it doesn't really show it too well, but you could also see like the industry outlook for auto companies in Europe. That's what the company, what they recommend in this company. And the interesting thing is the analysts predict that over the short term, interest rates are going to rise in the near future. So with our bond strategy, if we think interest rates are going to rise, basically we want to do short duration. 
So short duration being, generally we want less than 10 year bonds. I, I sometimes do something called bond laddering. Bond laddering is basically 2023 bonds, 2024, 2025, 2026. We spread across the interest rate risk. And then that way, I, that way I make money if interest rates go up. And then I'm able to lock into long duration bonds, generally around 8%. So if our long bonds are generally 8% and above, I usually tend to go heavy into bonds. So right now, we're going to go ahead and do our equity allocation. So we want a little bit of dividend, and we but we mainly want growth because we got 20-year time horizon. So we can see like the current outlook for the industries. But like generally, a very high growth industry in this game and in real life is biotechnology. You got computer, defense... Defense is temporarily doing well, long-term not going to do too well. And then the return on capital assets, it's very, very important to consider whenever you're playing Wall Street Raider because that's how much you're making off your investments, like your projects, your assets. And it's also good to consider as an investor because every $100 that I put into air transportation, they're only going to make about $9.40. So we're going to be trying to look for a business that is growing its uh, short-term and it's long term and has good it has good capital asset growth. So like for example, a good a good investment for maybe value dash dividend will be commodities special. So what we do is we go over to the industry and we can read about how the industry does. Uh, the industry outlook is uh, severe. Uh, near term is severe profit margins. So at the moment, commodity specialty aren't doing too well, but the long term, the outlook is supposed to be much better. So this might actually be a great turnaround play. So right here, we got ca return on capital assets. So another thing to consider is, for example, like this this one right here, EM, EMN has a 7% return on its capital assets. What's their borrowing rate? If you go over here to the bottom, you get 6.5% on their borrowing rate. So right now they're making 0.5% a year on their assets. So, and they also got a high PE, uh, a, a pretty low ROE, but they got low, low amount of debt and not a good dividend. So this would be a bit more of a good company for capital gains. But like, I'm also going to probably look at a bottom up analysis of the industry and compare projection here we go so like for example this company would be kind of a little bit pricey but like i'm looking for like 100 so like i'm looking for a good credit rating too that way they can survive downturns this is the best credit rating triple a mort ROH, ROH doesn't seem too bad. Like we can look through a lot of these. Uh, they do have a lot of. They have about. It looks like uh, nine hundred million in liquidity, and they have one point four billion dollars in bonds. And what's the current year? Current year is twenty twenty three. So are they able to cover? Like they have nine hundred million. They could also use their bank loan to. Uh, basically pay off their bond so this actually might be a good company to buy they got 28 times earnings that is quite high i generally look for a below 14 or fifth below 15 and the problem is they also have a lot of leverage 0 0.93 to 1 debt to equity so basically you get the total debts and then you divide it by the equity so right now they don't have too much uh they don't have too much equity and they do have a good RO, they have a decent ROE and a decent dividend yield. So like right now the company doesn't seem too hot, but the industry is supposed to be getting better. So we're, we're, we're going to have like a, hmm, it's a strong sell too. Let's look for a better company, a better industry that doesn't have as much debt. So usually utilities are very, very great for dividends because it usually stays around this percentage. And the great thing about utilities are everyone needs electricity. Everyone needs everyone needs heat and hydro. So that would be a bad idea. 
but like the industry currently is very very overvalued for utilities and the crit rains aren't too good so I'm probably gonna back out of the utilities another good one would be telecom for dividends uh, global telecom global telecommunications uh, nominal figure SBC would be a good buy ALU would be a good buy perhaps so it's either SBC or ALU SBC ALU has a lower price to earnings, but they don't have as much of a great credit rating. But they do have a great return on capital assets. They don't have they have about six billion in liquidity, a lot of debt. That's my only main concern. And that makes sense because they're a telecommunications. They don't have any earnings, they've been losing money every year, and they do have a lot of debt. So I'm gonna probably pick SBC instead, just because they're they got a lower credit rating. SBC, SBC. So SBC is a little bit more pricey, but I feel like it will be worth it. About eight billion dollars in liquidity, a lot less debt. They could probably comfortably pay back their debt. Uh, it's 109, so it's double the book value. So it's a little bit pricey, but. 35 times earnings, great ROE, low amount of debt, and a not very good dividend. So this will be our capital gain dash dividend growth company because their current dividend yield isn't very substantial. But you can look right here, they're about to they're about to, they're expected to make 39 cents a share in earnings. So right now the company is currently um $3.09. So this company isn't as bad as the other one. You know, we can also look at the earnings. There's no prior earnings available. You can list the shareholders. Most of the public owns it. And then you can also look at the cash flow of the business. So like this is also pretty important to look at. So right now, after the dividends and everything, they have about 2,400 in operating coming from. Uh, no, it'd actually be 1,900. And then the capital expenditures are expected to be 567 million. So the capital expenditures are the expenses needed in order to grow the business. So like I said with the op with uh, the cash flow statement, we got the operating right here at 1987 uh, 1980. You subtract out the investing, which is right here, invest in dash financing because there's dividends in there, there's uh yeah, there's dividends. And then we actually see that this company is actually generating free cash flow. So the free cash flow will be in this Subtracted by this, and yeah. So like right now, after paying back the debt, so right now the company is currently generating free cash flow. So I feel like this is a really good investment for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and buy twenty thousand, or AKA twenty percent of our portfolio will be in this one, one company. And then we have a hundred eleven dot oh eight. So this will be 108, we're gonna buy 180 shares of this business. And then we hit okay. So now we're a shareholder. So right now we have about 20% of our money invested in SBC communication. So we're also gonna pick another individual stock and then we're gonna pick our bonds and our Bitcoin and then we're done. And then we're gonna probably play around for maybe a year or two, but I'm starting to run out of time and it is very, very difficult explaining a lot of the stuff. But like that's our dividend growth company because the industry is supposed to do better over the long term, right? Uh, no, it's actually going to slow down a little bit, sadly. Okay, so that's our dividend dash growth company. We're going to pick a company that will actually grow. I think we should pick maybe a software company, perhaps. High priced earnings. This is a junk bond. Uh, junk. Yeah, the software industry seems a little bit elevated on priced earnings. Network. Yeah, let's not get into software. Let's do biotechnology. I tend to enjoy biotechnology a lot. Double B. Double B. Double A.
Okay, so I think this one would win. Another one I'm considering is this one, PDLI, but Abjects, I think, that's what the company is. Might be a good buy. My only concern is that they're junk grade. And if you look over here, the plant capacity for growth is 16%. So they're not cooling down on their business purchases dash capex. And they don't have too much liquidity. The bonds are due 2027. Current year is 2023. So they have a few years to pay it off. But if we look over here, you can see that they have about 300, 324 million of unused credit line. So they could theoretically use their credit line to pay back their bond. And if interest rates go down, they could theoretically refinance that debt into a cheaper bond, perhaps. But this company has a very, very high PE, has a decent dividend, but they have a very, very high debt to equity. That's my only concern. So this company might be a uh, potential for downgrade. So like, I wouldn't really want to own the bond for that. But the good news is they're expected to make eight cents for the next quarter. So they might be worth the high earnings. But this is a little bit more of a speculative company. So I'm not really tempted on doing that. They could make a turnaround though and be able to pay off their debt. Uh, it might be worth it actually. It's improving. You know what? I, I feel like it's a little bit of a risk, but we're going to go ahead and buy some Abjects Corporation for a little bit of growth. It is a little bit of a riskier play because it's junk grade, but we should be able to make a decent amount. Plus, the industry is hot, hot already as it is. So we're going to buy 25, uh, two, two, five, four shares. So right here, we got 40% and almost 40% in, in stock. So now we need to go ahead and do some bond laddering. And then we're basically going to be doing some Bitcoin and then we're done. So right now we got, so when you're here, I go over to like this thing, database search. And I do has bonds outstanding and buy. So right here, an interesting thing is it starts from uh, the, sh the shortest year to date to the longest year to date. So if you want long duration bonds, you literally scroll down to the very, very bottom. But these bonds right here are very, very liquid. So as you can see right here, it's 2023. This bond expi this bond it matures literally next year. So what we're gonna do is we'll probably invest like 20,000. Yeah, I'll probably do 2024, 2025 bonds, and then that's it. So we're gonna buy this 2020. So we're gonna we're gonna go and do 20,000 in this triple B company. But of course, you all you want to research the company before you buy. So as of right now, I got 15 billion dollars in cash, 47 billion dollars in stock, and they do have a very very low coupon bond, which is good for them. And they can actually call back for a little bit less. But they're currently not making any money. Do they have a credit line? Yeah, they have $47 billion in their unused credit line. So they can easily refinance their debt into variable debt very easily. So like this is a... And then they're actually going to make a profit too. Let's, let's see what kind of bonds they have. They're corporate bonds. Okay, so they're not convertible, sadly. I would like them to be convertible, but at the same time, this is a pretty decent coupon. We're going to be making about 3.88% yield. And this is a discount bond, which is nice. So what's the current price of the bond? It's at 96 something. So that's cool. So let's just put like half of our bond allocation into this. Over time, we're going to go into like more diversification, but... 96, 96.9. It's going to buy about 20 of these bonds. So right now we can see that we're buying it for a total value of about 19,446. So that's about half of our bond allocation. So right now we got some stocks. We got some cash and cash equivalents. We got some bonds. So I would like an extra 20 grand of bond. So let's go ahead and see if we can go ahead and do another bond for 2025. So like this bond is above par and it's triple C. 
we don't want to buy that. But like right here, General Electric, this would be a good bond because it's below par. So I'm going to be at about $2, uh, about $2 extra because it's going to mature at 100. So the yield right now is, the yield to maturity is much higher because the price is below 100. GE has $29 billion in cash, a bunch of working capital, which is interesting. And they don't have a lot of debt to equity. So they're very, very safe. And they are generating profits. Let's go and see what kind of bonds they have. So right here we go trade, buy. So we're going to buy a 2025 corporate GE bond. Sadly not convertible. Because like that stock I believe would be a decent buy. Didn't really look into it too much. But we just have to look at how much debt to equity they have generally. And how profitable they are. In order to make sure the bond's a good buy. So right here we got $20,000 budget. Divided by 980. I'm going to buy about 20 of these bonds. And that's about 20 grand. Cool. And so now we got 40% stock almost, 40% bond almost, and 20 grand of speculative. So do I want to buy junk bonds? Probably not. Let's just go ahead and get into some Bitcoin and Ethereum. So in order to do this for the new update for Bitcoin and Ethereum, you do exchange trade funds, enter. And you can see the different types of ETFs. So you do fund investment strategy. So a cool thing that you can actually do is you can invest in a lot of ETFs in this game. You got commodities, which I'm going to probably do later on. Might do natural resources. They got financial shares fund. That's interesting. But the two new ones they added were the Bitcoin and Ethereum Trust. You also got prudent government securities and blue chip fixed income and some junk bonds. So if I want exposure to junk bonds and I don't really feel like making my own junk bond portfolio, I would just simply buy up this ETF. So ETFs are, ETFs are going to make this game a lot more lower maintenance. So we're going to buy up some Bitcoin. So right here you can see the Bitcoin. Uh, the analyst is a buy. So the analyst is giving it a buy. And you can see they have about $4 billion and they have a bunch of cryptocurrency. One thing I would like the creator to do is actually make Bitcoin an asset on the commodity. Like add a Bitcoin and that. But at the moment, the only way you can get exposure to it in the game is off of these ETFs. So right now, the current stock price is at 106. The book value is 108. So right now, this is actually a quite good deal because the current valuation is less than actually what it's worth. So if we do the book value, it's... And they're triple A, don't have a lot of debt. And the dividends are 90% of the portfolio's income. So we're gonna go and get 10K of exposure to the words Bitcoin and 10K exposure to uh, Ethereum. And then we're gonna hold long term. And then we're gonna eventually do some trims. Like if we make a if we make a good return off this Bitcoin, we're gonna go ahead and trim it and then reallocate. So we're gonna buy 93 shares. Enter, 9,400. And then we also got a nerve, 10,000 for the Ethereum. So we go over here. Exchange trade funds, fund investment strategy, Ethereum. So what we're going to do is we're just going to buy the rest of Ethereum. It's a hold, but I'm okay with that. So at the moment, we are sticking to our asset allocation. We have almost $0 in cash. And then if you ever are curious, how do you, how do you get the percentages of the asset allocation or etc.? Well, sadly, it's uh, a lot higher. So like if we do 61,178, divide that by the total assets of 100,000, 100,182, we get about 61% in stocks right now. And we have about 40% in bonds. So right now we are quite overweight on stocks. But that's just because we have these ETFs that hold Bitcoin and Ethereum. So technically, we are at 20% Bitcoin and Ethereum. So right now, we're going to go ahead and hold these assets for a good while and see if they actually go up in price. So an interesting thing I like you to do, too, is I like to type down the cost basis of the shares. Uh, just that way we know if we're in the money or out of the money on them. 
So right now we have SBC. So our cost basis per share. So our share price, our average cost is 111. And then for the other company, ABGX, we bought it at $8.87. And then Bitcoin, uh, so it'd be G uh, GBTC. And we bought that at 106.89. This is just to tell if we made a profit off this or not. So ETHE 111.40. So I'm quite confident with our portfolio because we we uh, right now yields are likely to go up. So our short-term bonds are going to mature soon. So if we go over to our bond portfolio, 2024 bonds and 2025 bonds. So as of right now, it's 2023. So we got two years until we get our entire 40 grand back. But we're going to get our 20 grand back soon. And so if rates do go up aggressively, then we're going to be doing good. And then I'll think about buying longer duration. But right now we're just going to chill for a while. So Bitcoin is doing quite well. It's at 115. We bought 106. Ethereum's doing okay. Ethereum Trust announces a two for one stock split. So with the stock split, they're making more shares. So that's why it fell. So right now we have to know how much our Ethereum is. So our Ethereum Trust, we bought in at. 55.70 so at the moment we're on a loss for the bitcoin and we didn't make too much on the bitcoin at the moment we only made about a grand so we're going to continue waiting sbc is doing all right and abjects is doing all right but we want to make sure we check the when we're going to check the portfolio in May 17th. That's when earnings is. And generally, whatever earnings season comes up, you want to pay attention to your companies and make sure they're doing well. Like, check their balance sheet, check their cash flow, check their earnings report. Earnings report is probably the easiest thing to check. And another interesting thing is, right here we got our portfolio. And right now, if you were to do the math, 64,863. Divide by 102.435, we get about 63% in stock. So our our stock and crypto portfolio has gone up by about 3%, while our bonds have actually fallen in price. That makes sense because if you look over here, we bought short duration bonds, thankfully, because it says that interest rates were going to go up. So we bought short duration bonds, so things are not as bad, but they are quite bad right now. We lost about two grand on our bond portfolio. But if I bought longer duration bonds, I would have a bigger loss. So I'm glad I bought short duration. So now we're just going to wait. And once we do get our bond money back, once we do get our bond money back from this company, we're going to go ahead and we're going to roll that money back in to these 8% bonds. So like, for example, we could look over here on database search bonds and then now we look at long duration bonds so like we want to look at maybe an investment grade so like right here this would be a good bond to buy 10 percent coupon six percent six percent is a coupon but the yield right now is 10.56 so i would love to buy that bond and make a 10 percent return another cool thing i like to i learned was 72 divided by 10.56 Two divide by 10.56 so it will take us about seven years to double our money so that's something called the rule 72 so in order to tell like the compounding of a portfolio you can just do the rate of return but that's before tax so it would probably take us above seven years to break to double our money on this bond but still a 10 percent coupon is very very exceptional so we're going to go ahead and once our bond we could theoretically take a loss on this bond for 486 and we can lock into long duration. But I'm going to wait until 2024. We, we are being a little bit greedy though. I actually think it might be worth the loss to be honest. Because uh, interest rates did go up aggressively. So we're going to take a small loss on this bond and get cash now. So we're going to get about 50... 
dollar commission. So we're gonna eighteen hundred. So we're gonna lose about almost one thousand one hundred dollars, about or like a capital loss. But we have cash now. We have nineteen grand, and we're gonna go ahead and put that into a long duration bond because you've seen interest rates literally go straight up. So usually I tend to do bond trade in this game, but we're mainly going to be doing bonds for what they're meant for. We're going to hold these bonds into maturity and get a great yield on it. So we're going to get a 10% yield until 2042. So that's a pretty exceptional yield. So we're going to get this income for looks like almost 20 years, about 19. So we're going to be getting an exceptional rate of return every year. And they do have not much liquidity, but they probably have a, yeah, they have a lot of credit line. So they're good. Right? And a decent amount of debt. A decent dividend. Yep, this would be a great this would be a great bond to buy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna buy a bunch of this bond because it's a long duration bond and it yields ten percent. Another thing right now, we are currently we are currently inverted by a little bit. So an inverted yield curve is when short term bonds are higher than long term bonds. And we are currency, currently experiencing a bit of an inversion in the yield curve right now in real life. So an inversion in the yield curve, if this is this were like, for example, 13% for the short bond and 10 or 9 for the long, that will be a clear inversion. And after that happens, it means that there's a recession nearby. So we're going to buy 29 of these bonds. And now we're just going to chill. We're not going to do too much. We're going to go ahead and use the 2024, uh, 2025 bond. Once that gets matured and we get our money back, we're going to go ahead and go into another long duration if rates stay up high. But right now they could fall. That's why I took a loss on that, on the 2024 bond because 2042 at 10%, pretty great. So if we look at our cash flow, so right now we're making about $4.16 on our cash. Corporate bonds, we're making 2900 Annual dividend income, 952. So we make that much. Bond discount. Because we bought we bought the 2042 bond for like $666. That's why the yield was so high, because it's below par. And so like then after that we got projected tax and we got taxes on that. So we're gonna be making about thirty two hundred dollars a year after taxes. Oh not thirty two hundred after a year after taxes, twenty eight hundred. But basically, this is a 6% bond, 6.45% bond. But right now, it's at $650 per bond. And it's going to mature at $1,000. So that's why the yield to maturity is so high. Because right now, current interest rates are high. So that, that has hurt the value or like the price of the bond. And has made the yield go up. So right now, we're just going to chill and wait for our portfolio to do some work. At the moment, it's not working too well. But... We have into 2043. So this bond, I believe we bought, is for 2042. So we're gonna keep this bond into maturity. And then by 2043, we'll be retired and we're gonna be good. So right now our Bitcoin ain't doing too well and our Ethereum's doing okay. And SPC Corporation's doing all right and so is Abjects. Oh, okay, I forgot to check earnings. That's my bad. We're gonna check earnings now, I guess. Uh, CRLY, CRLY is where? Oh, okay, we're, we're just tracking CRLY. So right now, we have made about seven grand off of Abijax, and we lost two grand on SBC, and we've lost some money on the crypto. But basically, in order to calculate the percentage return on our investment, we'll do 12.31. Subtract that by... 8.87 and we divide it by our price that we paid 8.87 so as of right now we have made about a 38 percent return on abjects which makes sense because it's a little bit more of a speculative company so they've probably done a lot better no, not much liquidity quite a high price to book value but they are doing really well with their profits because last Last, last year they made 18. Right now they're at 14. It's halfway done the year. 
53 times earnings is quite high. A lot of debt. So they don't have much. Yeah, they have about $468 in equity. So that's my main prop, my main concern. Is that if this goes to zero, it means they're insolvent. And if they have trouble paying their bond coupons, they could become insolvent. So that's my biggest fear, is that the company becomes insolvent. But the industry is currently hot. Okay, so it might be worth considering trimming. Especially if it's like 20 or something. Okay, right now it's at 16. So what we do is we do six, uh, where is it? I'm going a little bit above the episode time. So right now we got uh, 16.94 subtracted by 8. Dot, oh, I'm so bad at this stuff. Sometimes I have trouble with keyboards. 16.94 subtracted by 8.87 divided by 8.87. So right now we made about a 90% return on abjects. So that was a good, good turnaround. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure we protect our capital gains because right now we made 18 grand off of abjects. And as you can see right now, our portfolio is a bit of out of whack. Like if you look over here, 83,614, which is in Bitcoin and Ethereum and equities, divided by 120, 016. We get about 69% in crypto and crypto and equity and the rest is in fixed income we have a little bit of cash which is nice too so what we want to do is we want to ideally put that back up to 60 percent because we're at 69 percent in equities and stuff so we're just gonna go a little bit below target i believe and just collect our profit on this company so we're gonna collect our 90 percent return we made off of this speculative biotech company so what we're going to do is 17.8118. So what you do is you just do your unrealized gain, divide it by the share price, and you get how many shares you have to trim in order to take home the 18 grand. But the, you don't make 18 grand in capital gains. So we're going to sell about 1,000 shares. So what we do is we go to abjects, say we're on abjects, cool. So we go over here to sell. They're currently still junk. And the buy rain from analyst, but we're gonna do 10889. And then basically, if we wanna get the profit per share, we do 17.18 subtracted by 8.87. We get $8.31 profit per share, and we're selling about 1,089 shares. So basically, off of selling $18,000 of stock, we make about 9,000 of that will be profit. So we made about a nine grand profit just for buying a speculative company. So we went on and sold it, our realized capital gain, $9,012, not bad. So sadly we'll have to pay tax on the nine grand. So if you go down here to the bottom, you can see how much taxes you're expected to pay. So we made $8,300 in capital gains so our income tax yeah so we're expected to pay like this much in tax so that's why we're going to keep a bit of cash right now we're going to keep 19 grand in cash right now temporarily and then we're going to use that to pay off for taxes so right now it actually might be a good idea to sell the bitcoin too because if you look at the bitcoin we made about three grand off of it so like if we look over here, we can calculate how much percent we made. So if 159.58 subtracted by 106.30 divided by 106.30, we made a 50% return off Bitcoin so far. So it may be worth trimming and then uh, bringing it back down to the base. But then again, 50% for Bitcoin, I've, I think I've seen it go up like near 80 but, it, oh, there we go. That's a good time to sell. <laughs> Just went up an extra 17 bucks. So now there's a lot of euphoria for Bitcoin. And in real life, we're experiencing not a lot of euphoria for Bitcoin. People are selling all of it like crazy. 
So right now, we're, we want to take advantage of the Euphoria and take home a 47% return. Yeah, we put 10k in, we made 47%. So we're just going to take the four, take the 4,000. Because it could crash. Worst case scenario, it goes down. We go ahead and buy the dip. So what we do is we sell. It's currently a buy, but we're just going to sell uh, $4,000 worth at 156.17. So we're going to sell 29 shares of our 93. And we'll make about a $1,400 capital gain, which is above our $50 that we have to pay. Oh, above our $10 commission. So we made about $1,400. So there we go. Our, so now our portfolio has a lot of cash. And we're going to go ahead and deploy that into more bonds or deploy it into more equity. But as of right now, I think I see a better opportunity in bonds. So like I like. Like I said before, this is a dynamic, I think, asset allocation, where dynamic or... I always get confused between dynamic and the other things. Strategic, dynamic, tactical. So we're kind of doing uh, a bit of dynamic dash tactical, because we're keeping a bit of cash for the tactical. And for the dynamic, we're basically buying what we think is a great deal. So right now, bond yields are high. So I see bonds as a good deal and equities is not as a good deal. So we want to keep a bit of liquidity just for cash. And we're intentionally going to go above our limit of 40-40. But that's our long term. So right now, we're expected to pay about $2,000 in tax. So right now, we have about $24,000. So I'm going to probably put twenty k into bonds. So we're going to buy long duration. Because I would like income. Right here we got a 12% uh, yield. 13% yield for a junk. That's a long duration junk. So no thanks. I'm thinking I'm okay with masks though. So like this company. They have $10 billion in liquidity. Been losing money every quarter. Expected to make profit. Okay. So we're going to buy 20 grand of this and go above our target, sadly. But we're temporarily going to do that. Once, e once bond yields fall, we'll go ahead and then go back into our target. So we're going to buy 33 bonds. 19 the grand. So right now we got about 3K in cash. That's for taxes. And right now we got 63K. And we divide it by 122, 173, 51%. So right now we have to get up 9% on our stock portfolio in order to hit our balance. And then we also got the corporate bonds are a bit above target. So right now we're, we're overweight bonds by like 5%. So we're eventually going to have to do that. Okay, that's going to call it for today's episode. Because uh, I got a call, I got a call from someone, and plus I don't want these videos to go on too long because I tend to stream for a while and get into the flow and enjoy it. But I feel like today we have covered a lot of things today about how to value bonds and how to value, uh, basically stock. So right now our stock portfolio is doing alright, and Abjects just keeps going up in price. So we're still making money off of it, but we took our profit of eighteen. Uh, we took a profit of like nine grand capital gains. And we put 20k in so we got about half our money back just for the stock going up so like i'm just gonna keep making capital gains and then redistributing that capital gains towards it like maybe next episode we may consider selling the ethereum if it goes up a little bit more because right now we made about th uh 2.4 grand off of it yeah th thanks uh thanks crypto any other concerns or any questions before i head out I think uh, today was a pretty good day for bonds and our long duration right now are getting, is quite getting destroyed because yields keep going up, not as aggressively, but we're basically going to be doing long duration next episode. We're going to go a, a quite above target, but I'm hoping 
that are that are if Bitcoin and Ethereum grow in price, and we're able to reinvest into long duration. Anyways, that's it for today. I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys later.